And then there's some of the insect pests that don't even look like insects. This is one that uh, when I, I do a class on insect identification and I tell them that all insects have a head, a thorax, and an abdomen, and they have six legs and can have four to uh, no wings, uh, I show them a picture of a scale and I, <clears throat> I say, okay, point out the insect features. The only stage of a, most of the scale insects that looks anything like an insect is the very first stage out of the egg called the crawler. And so these are pine needle scales. This is a, a highly magnified shot of them on a spruce needle. Another great uh, common name because I see them more on spruce trees than I ever do on pine needles. But uh, they uh, are scale insects and, and certainly they can be a problem. It's one of the more common ones on spruce trees in Laramie. Uh, to see these. Uh, they generally don't kill the tree, but they can stress it a lot and they can make it look pretty unsightly. And then pests can also have multiple IDs and even hidden importance. Uh, you probably all uh, like uh, have these. I had them eating my tulips. Uh, these are uh, cutworms. Uh, there's army cutworms and uh, pale striped cutworms and, and different varieties, but they all are the immature stage of noctuid moths. Uh, it's a f very large family of moths that are all pretty commonly known as Miller moths. This is the pupa. They make, instead of a, a silk-covered cocoon, they make a bare pupa, and you'll find that in the soil too when you're out working in your garden. Uh, and why do I have a picture of a grizzly bear there? Well, they've figured out that the cutworms, which are starting to move, I actually had some around my horse's manger uh, yesterday morning, um, they uh, are starting to move uh, from the prairie. They make a migration in the spring. They follow the uh, elevation up and will spend the summer in the high alpine areas. And grizzly bears, they found in many parts of, of the, uh, uh, their range where they still remain, like around the Yellowstone Mountains and in, in uh, uh, Montana uh, above Timberline, will actually go up there to feed on the miller moths because the millers will be out at night feeding on nectar on, on these uh, mountain alpine flowers and then during the day they'll uh, seek shelter under rocks and the grizzly bears will be over there flopping rocks and eating miller moths. And you might think it's kind of crazy, you know, a four or five hundred pound bear uh, spending all that time doing that, you know. <coughs> they figured that uh, a researcher out of uh, Yellowstone National Park figured that a bear consumed, based on, I guess, looking, examining the, the feces, about 40,000 millers in a day. And that's 20,000 calories. 20,000 calories. Isn't that amazing? So I, uh, how intertied things are. Uh, the Miller moths will make a reverse migration uh, and come back out of the mountains and into the plains uh, to lay their eggs in the late uh, summer and early fall. <coughs> You have some that you might even not even recognize. You might think it's just some sort of a, a, a problem with your plant. Uh, some of these are gall farming. There's insects and mites that cause these uh, formations on plants. Depends on where they occur on the plants. Uh, it, it's it, some of them are pretty fantastic looking. There's one that occurs on oak that looks like something that Dr. Seuss drew because it ends up being fuzzy and bright pink. But uh, <clears throat> there's uh, other things that are leaf miners which. My boss, he kind of, he says it doesn't really hurt the goose foot very much, but the, the, he likes the patterns they make in the leaves. They're living in between the top and bottom layers of the leaf, the, the larva, and mining their way around. You can often see where they start, like that was the entry point. Swirl around and it probably pupated over here and emerged. And, and there's uh, there's uh, dipterns and, and beetles, coleopterans, uh, so flies and beetles uh, are two of the major ones that, that do leaf mining. There's also scraping pests, they, where they don't really chew the leaf up. They have uh, thrips, are the major one of this. Uh, <clears throat> they have uh, a modified mandible that sticks out and can scrape the surface of plants and then they suck up the, the plant juices that are in response to that so they cause this discoloration but they don't really consume the tissue so much. Um, most of adult thrips are about the size of a comma in 12 point font so they're pretty small. A lot of times if you take flowers, if you're seeing this kind of damage and you take a sheet of white paper and you whack that flower on there you can see the little thrips crawl out of there. 
Um, sometimes people, uh, like if they live near areas, uh, say down in Colorado where they grow onions, when they go through and they knock the tops down, uh, the onion thrips will move off those fields in mass and they go right through standard screening on windows and they will get on people and they will try to taste test you. And some people have sensitive enough skin, they get uh, uh, an effect from it. Uh, you can also have that occur uh, just with grass thrips from mowing of a, a, a field and they'll move out and sometimes get on people. And they're hard to see. I mean, uh, uh, with my eyesight now, uh, I could probably find the right place in my glasses to look at them, but uh, they're, they're pretty difficult to see without magnification. And then, of course, there's the pests of gardeners, not just the, their, their, their plants. Uh, mosquitoes, essentially, um, because of their ability to transmit diseases, are the most dangerous animal in the world. That's what I tell kids when I, I go do school presentations. I ask them, well, what do you think is the most dangerous animal in the world? And they'll say things like grizzly bears or white, great white sharks. And then I show them a picture of a mosquito. And I tell them that uh, the mosquitoes transmit diseases that kill between two and three million people in the world each year. And they sicken hundreds of millions more. <laughs> and it's certainly this year, I'm hoping, keeping my fingers crossed, that the mosquitoes won't be quite as bad. But if we're ha going to have a hot, dry summer, the mosquito that transmits West Nile virus will be more probably abundant and also have the ability for to transmit the virus better. Because uh, the virus, you, you might think of the mosquito as being like a, say like a dirty hypodermic needle and that it bites a, a bird that's got West Nile and then it can go bite somebody else. It actually, the virus has to replicate in the mosquito and it requires an ambient temperature around 80 degrees to do so. So most years in Laramie, we stay cool. It's very rare that they think that anybody who gets West Nile got it in the Laramie Valley. They figure they usually pick it up from a bite from some of the surrounding country that we have that is got those kinds of temperatures and has an abundance of Culex tarsalis, the primary vector in our region. And, and so uh, certainly uh, I want to remind people when you're out working in your gardens, because a lot of times you do it early in the morning, which in most time in Wyoming, the mosquitoes are a little stiff early in the morning, mm -hmm. but in the evening is another critical time when you should be wearing uh, some protection uh, for uh, mosquito repellent uh, and keep that in mind when you're out in the garden. <clears throat> Even their pests of, of pets too. This is all these are mosquitoes on the horse. Last summer it just uh, makes it pretty unpleasant to be around Laramie for a few months. But at least uh, or a few weeks. At least it, our mosquito season is months long. Mosquitoes as pollinators. There, there was an article recently in Nature about uh, mosquitoes as being pollinators because the male mosquitoes, you can't really see this one very well, he's got feathery antenna, he's a male mosquito. They do feed on nectar uh, alone. The females feed on nectar for carbohydrate source and energy, but their blood, they want blood to form their eggs. And if you look at here, there's one, two, three, four, five mosquitoes on this little flower. I, I had it identified at one time, but I can't remember what it is. It grows out on the prairie. It's hard to get pictures of mosquitoes on flowers because the females, as soon as they recognize you're there trying to take a picture of them, they come at you, but the, the males ignore you. <laughs> It, the, there's some uh, disagreement on whether they are uh, very effective as pollinators. A lot of people think with their long proboscis and, and not having very uh, uh, essentially the body form to be good uh, pollen carriers that they just steal nectar. But that might be just a prejudice because they're mosquitoes. Stinging pests. This is another one that's a pretty common pest around Laramie uh, for gardeners. Uh, in a way, they can be quite beneficial because the uh, the paper wasps, uh, like, uh, well, this is a European paper wasp, recently introduced species, but uh, many of our common uh, paper wasps, the uh, aerial ones that build uh, their nests up in trees or under the eaves of buildings, or the ground nesting species, are very effective predators. The, the female workers go out and they scour the vegetation for caterpillars and other soft-bodied insects, which they take back to the nest and chew up and feed as bug burger to their, their younger sisters. 
and, and so essentially, uh, I feel that uh, uh, paper wasps give bees a bad name because m probably 95% of the time when people say I've been stung by a bee, it was actually a yellow jacket that did it because uh, they're very aggressive. They, they're very aggressive defending their nest. If, if the, here's one uh, control suggestion I have for them. Now's the time to buy the wasp traps in the hardware stores and put them out because if you put out a wasp trap now and you catch a new queen who's trying to establish her nest and she might be out foraging herself, you've wiped out that nest completely. Or if you catch her first brood of workers, then you've also put a real big dent in that population later in the summer. If you try to put out the wasp trap later in the summer after the nest has got, say, three or four hundred workers, you might catch quite a few wasps, but you didn't really make a dent in the population very much in your yard. And so I don't think we're going to cause any local extinction of, of paper wasps by putting out traps. But if you have problems with with uh, wasps in your in your yards, then now is a good time to put them out because you'll, you'll be more effective. You won't catch as many wasps, but the ones you catch will really help put a dent in their population. Now plants can fight back. Not all of them uh, as directly as a pitcher plant, which has developed this uh, method of, of catching insects to help supplement its nitrogen needs. But plants, a lot of times, if you're having problems with plants in your landscape, a lot of times, say, if you've got, say, three spruce trees, one of them has always got problems. It's got scales, it's got, you know, the ips attack the top, things like that. It's probably stressed by either where it was put, uh, something that's happening to its roots, you know, maybe it's too close to the alley or the street, uh, those types of things. So plants, they do have defenses against insects, not as obvious as this. So that's another thing to keep in mind. Sometimes, uh, you know, you can do things to bolster the plant's health and make them fight off insects better. Or sometimes you just give up and you get rid of the plant like my little stunted lilac and you get something that would uh, grow better and be more resistant. <clears throat> There are some sites out on the internet that are pretty useful. This is one. Uh, it's got a really weird web address. Uh, so the way I find it is I do do a search for HP IPM. And in Google it pops up very uh, close to the top. High Plains IPM Guide. And so it has a lot of specific uh, chapters. Probably not a lot of interest in the crops or livestock. But it does have horticulture and weed links. It has uh, lots of different topics including um, you know, biocontrol, organic insecticides, protection of the pollinators. And it's updated. It's a consortium of uh, North Dakota, South Dakota, Montana, Wyoming, Nebraska, and Colorado. They put this together. They try to keep it updated and, and have uh, 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 good information on there uh, uh, all the time. So if you, I could say the easiest way I found is to search for HP IPM and, and just do it that way. High Plains Integrated Pest Management. So now let's talk about a few good bugs for a change. Uh, I mean, everybody knows the, the lady beetle or lady bird beetle or lady bug. Um, certainly, they're pretty common. A lot of people, they don't recognize this. This is the larva of the lady bird beetle. I've had people ask me how to control these things because they might have had a tree with a big aphid infestation, had an abundance of larvae, and they were sometimes falling out of there. And they'll pinch you they'll, if they get on you, stuff like that. They're not going to hurt you. This has got an aphid in its jaw. And they're, they're really voracious predators of aphids. Uh, certainly, uh, maybe people wouldn't recognize it. This is a skymus uh, variety of uh, ladybird or ladybug or lady beetle. Uh, and people might not recognize that. They, they always uh, recognize the, the more traditional one. Yes? I have some ladybugs ordered. Mm -hmm. um, what, what would be the most effective way to release them? I know I want some in my greenhouse, mm -hmm. and I'm told mm -hmm. to release them at night. And, and not have them fly off. Do you, do you have aphids? Yes. You do have aphids. Okay. Well, some should f find those aphids and, and stay in, in place uh, some eggs. The other suggestion I could say is you, you take your ladybugs to your neighbors, have them release them, and they'll fly to your place instead of going to theirs. <laughs> Uh, I've also heard of uh, a mad scientist method of doing this is you could uh, take the, uh, while they're still chilled, you can spray them with a little bit of flat pop, like 7-Up, so it's kind of syrupy, 
and I've heard that it's supposed to glue their elytra together, <laughs> and so then they'll be less likely to fly off, but I, I, I just kind of doubt that. But uh, if you have aphids, then you should get some of them to stay. Because, and, and I would think that having it, uh, you know, if it, if it was a hot day and you had the box out where it was really hot and so they were all stirred up and ready to go, it's, but if it's cool and you let them out and they'll be gradually coming out, I would think that would be the better strategy. But <laughs> this is another form of the larvae. A lot of people wouldn't recognize this. I actually was contacted by some folks in, in Big Piney. They saw these, they thought they had uh, woolly pine aphids, or, or woolly adelgids, uh, actually, and it uh, turned out, it, you know, it just didn't sound right because they were moving around a lot and they had scales on there. And, and a lot of the Skymus uh, larvae will attack scale insects. And so that's what it turned out. When they sent me the sample, it turned out they were getting ready to treat a beneficial. So it's always important important to, to identify your insects. That's the first step in IPM. Another good aphid predator are lacewings. And if you ever see this on the edges of your leaves, leave them alone. That's the egg of a lacewing, a green or brown lacewing. They're such voracious predators, they think that they put them on these stalks because if, if they put their eggs close by to each other, the first one out would eat the others. And, and so this is the larva uh, eating an aphid here, and the adult. Uh, they have beautiful eyes. They're very small insects, but if you ever get a chance to look at them up close, their eyes are like just iridescent bronze colored. Very pretty. And then, of course, insects are part of the food chain. In this case, I'd put that up chain because I'm you know, carrying the long skinny caterpillar. But uh, uh, certainly, you know, ants can be beneficial. They can be uh, uh, good scavengers. Some of them are good predators. And then, of course, there's other ants that have developed really uh, elaborate relationships with aphids. There's the cornfield ant and uh, corn root aphid, where they actually move them to their nest to overwinter them. They'll move them to a, a suitable Host plants. Will move the aphids, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And they'll move them to suitable host plants outside of the cornfield until the corn gets developed enough. And then they'll move them into the cornfield. Yeah. Yeah. And and then of course the, the food web. Even even the the miserable old mosquito is important in that respect because here you have uh, this is a mosquito larva. Uh, they breathe air. They have a siphon tube up there. They have to break the surface of the water to get their oxygen. This is the pupa, which will from that will emerge the winged form, and they also have to breathe air. And uh, essentially, this is a thing uh, a damselfly eating a mosquito. And then of course here you have a bird eating the damselfly. So even those types of things, you know, they have some importance, even though they can make our lives kind of miserable. And it's never black or white in the insect world. It's always kind of gray because you can have things like a dragonfly, although a, this big of a dragonfly would not be too interested in little bitty mosquitoes. They actually would probably be after other damselflies and, and other things like that. Uh, but as a, 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 an aquatic larva, they would have been happily eating mosquito larvae. Uh, that was one thing that was very neat last summer uh, with all the, uh, the dragonflies and damselflies that came off of the floodplain uh, of the Laramie River. It was really spectacular how many were out and about. But, like I said, you never can trust an insect. Sometimes, if you like butterflies, they might not know any better and they'll take out a butterfly. So I guess with that, kind of wrapping it up, I don't know if I can convert garden folk into uh, being insect lovers. You know, maybe it is hard to love a fly. I don't know, it's kind of neat. <laughs> Even, even here's another fly. You know, I know in Wyoming, lots of people have problems with grasshoppers late in the summer on their gardens. Here is a member of Bombillidae, a uh, bee fly. Uh, it has a proboscis, but it won't suck blood from you. They feed on nectar for an energy source. It's, she's a female, and she's laying her uh, larva. Or actually, I think they lay eggs first, and then they hatch out. And then the larva crawl around in the upper layer of the soil where the grasshopper eggs are. And then when they find grasshopper egg pods, the larva, if they encounter them, if they're lucky enough to do so, then they'll eat those eggs within the egg pod. And that'll be the next generation of bee fly. So here's an egg pod, and then the species of grasshopper that laid that, and then the bee uh, fly larva that was in there eating it. 
So with that, do you think the world could survive uh, and be a very healthy place without insects? No. No. No, they're, they're pretty vital. Uh, I, I don't expect you all to become big insect lovers, but I figure that uh, maybe you'll come away with a, a little bit more of an appreciation of what they do for you, that they're not all bad, and uh, that the first step, if you are having pest problems, is identify them or get them identified yourself. And, and with that, uh, like I said, um, if you're going to have two books, <coughs> this old Peterson's Field Guide to Insects is a great one to have. It's pretty low cost. Um, if I had more time, I would have gone over and, and showed you how to utilize the uh, uh, key to the principal orders of insects. So that can, you know, if you figure out you've got an insect, you can figure out generally what order they belong to with this book. And then this book is really good because with that information about uh, the insect order, you know what their mouth parts are and what kind of damage they could inflict to your plants. And you can go through, as Whitney organized his thing, his chapters, he has like chapter three, leaf chewers. And with that, see I think we're getting close to the end. I don't want to run over time. I guess I'm just striving for peaceful coexistence with insects. <laughs> So, and then we have a website, and then also for uh, those folks who might be concerned about other exotic pests that might be introduced to the uh, Wyoming or the country, uh, the Cooperative Ag Pest Survey Program website is also interesting to visit. Well, thank you so much, Scott. You're welcome. Thanks. 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 All right, do we have some time for questions? <laughs> I probably answered them all, didn't I? <laughs> I'm sure folks have a lot of questions. Yes? Do ants ever cause damage to plants? Yeah, they they can uh, cause some damage. You know, of course, uh, we don't have leaf cutters in Wyoming. At least I've never seen any. But leaf cutter ants in the tropics can cause uh, problems. The the uh, there uh, some of the species that nurse aphids and they'll move them around and provide protection to the aphids from predators. That's also a problem. Uh, there's some of them that will go after uh, plants in the garden um, and go after things like seeds or fruits and stuff but for the most part you know the ants um, uh, you know the, some of the sweet feeding ants will go after those types of things and, 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 but uh, you know the, like I say they can be kind of good and bad uh, in in the south they've learned that uh, the imported fire ant is a pretty effective part of their integrated pest management for cotton because uh, the, the, the fire ant can get after cotton boll weevil pretty effectively. Really? Mm -hmm. Yeah. No. There's always a good and a bad. Yes? about the use of diatomaceous earth for insect control? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Remember when I was talking about the exoskeleton being very important for moisture mm -hmm. cons conservation? Well, they think the diatomaceous earth, which has uh, got lots of little silica bodies from uh, the diatoms that uh, accumulated on an ocean floor in ancient times, they abrade the cuticle. And, and so that can be an effective uh, control measure because they can dehydrate, especially in our climate. It's probably uh, really effective, really in a drier climate, uh, uh, because of that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, once or twice a year, my ants take wing and blossom. Mm -hmm. What are they doing? Uh, that's the the that ant uh, species. Um, a lot of times, uh, ants seem to do it about. 24 to 36 hours after a rainstorm, uh, what they'll do is is the alate ants, the winged reproductives, will be released from the, the nest. And so they'll go, and a lot of times, if you have a house on a hilltop, uh, th that's nice for a view, but it's not nice from that standpoint in that they often orient to a, a high point on the horizon. And they can swarm on houses, or uh, I've done in field work, I've left my pickup truck sitting on a hill top where I could see it, had the uh, windows rolled down, and I come back and I got flying ants all over and inside the vehicle and stuff. And that's what they're doing is, is that, the, that enables those species within that area uh, to have their reproductives meet and mate, and then the queens go off and try to start new colonies from there. Um, yeah. Yeah. 
Well, if there's no more questions, I guess. Yes. Yes, Roland. So Hi. Other than um, ladybugs, mm -hmm. humans, and greenhouses, mm -hmm. what, what, do you, what can you do? Well, uh, as far as a biocontrol effort against them, uh, certainly, uh, you know, there's the green lace wings uh, th that are available. Uh, the other thing, you know, aphids are soft-bodied, uh, and uh, for using uh, products, you know, with integrated pest management, you don't want to just rely on one thing. Uh, so, uh, utilizing products that can be compatible with, say, your biocontrol releases of ladybugs or green lace wings is good, uh, uh, and in that sense uh, uh, you can utilize uh, hosing if your plants can take it because uh, uh, aphids are, are very soft and uh, they don't move very well if you wash them off of plants into the uh, soil uh, that can uh, kill them. Uh, uh, if you step up you can get the insecticidal soaps and it, always check and make sure your plant is not sensitive to it. Most of the ones that are formulated specifically for that rather than say uh, uh, a dish detergent and stuff, uh, they've, they've chosen uh, soaps that have uh, the f uh, fatty acid chains that are effective at disruption of the insects, uh, 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 exoskeleton, the soft-bodied one, and it's also not going to uh, harm most plant tissue.